journalist Patrick Moore with the latest on the sky at night. Good evening. We've been hearing a great deal about Comet Swift-Tuttle. Now this is a most interesting comet. It was discovered in 1862 and was found to be the parent comet of the August meteors we call the Perseids. And the period was worked out as 120 years. So it should have been back in 1982. It didn't turn up. Many people, including me, thought it had come and gone unseen. But then Brian Marsden in America recomputed the orbit and gave a period of 130 years. And sure enough, this year, back it came. And you might like to see some pictures of it taken in November. Here is one by John Fletcher. And here's a second one by Harold Ridley. Not bright, and the comet is not going to be bright this time, but it will be back in 130 years, and next time it's going to come really close to us. And there have been rather alarmist reports that it may even hit us. I don't think that's at all likely. I would say the chances of the Earth being hit by Swift Tuttle are several hundred to one against. But it will come close, and in 130 years' time, it will be a brilliant naked eye object. But um, I very much fear that you and I won't be here to see it. Much nearer ahead, we're going to have a total eclipse of the Moon. And that's due on the night of December the 9th, 10th, and it goes over midnight. Now, I'm quite sure you know what happens during a lunar eclipse. The Moon passes into the cone of shadow cast by the Earth. And since the moon shines entirely by reflected sunlight, your supply of direct sunlight is cut off. But generally, the moon doesn't vanish completely because some of the sun's rays are refracted or bent onto the moon by way of the shell of atmosphere surrounding the Earth. And generally, the eclipsed part turns a dull, very often coppery colour before it comes out of the shadow again. And that's what we're going to see. And I'll give you a timetable. The eclipse begins on December the 9th at 2200 hours, and totality begins at 23.07. Totality ends at 0.021, and the entire eclipse ends at 0.128. And it'll be fascinating to watch the progress as the Earth's shadow creeps across the Moon. But this could be an exceptionally interesting eclipse. But bear in mind that all the light reaching the eclipsed Moon must get there via the Earth's atmosphere. And everything depends upon how the Earth's atmosphere is. We've had Mount Pinotubo. There's a tremendous amount of volcanic material in the upper atmosphere, and this could cause a blocking of the light. There was a partial lunar eclipse earlier on this year, not visible from here, I saw it from America, and the eclipsed part disappeared completely. And I'm prepared to believe that at this coming eclipse, the eclipsed moon will vanish. I don't know, got to wait and see. But it is going to be very interesting indeed, and I recommend photographers to get busy. And also, just casting your mind back, December 1972, the last men on the moon, Apollo 17 on the lunar surface. And there's a picture of the scene as they saw it then. And I just wonder, when are the next men going to go back to the moon? It could be quite soon. We've got to wait and see. And now, on to my main topic for tonight. The lovely constellation of Orion is now beautifully visible in the evening sky after sunset. And you can't mistake it. It's very distinctive, with the two brilliant leaders, the orange-red Betelgeuse, the glittering white Rigel, 60,000 sun power, and Orion is a lovely guide. Downward, the three stars of the hunter's belt show the way to Sirius, the dog star, the brightest star in the sky. We can also find Procyon in the little dog, and then the twins, Castor and Pollux, and of course at the moment, the red planet Mars, which is now getting very bright. It comes to opposition next month, and I'll have much more to say about it in the next sky at night. Then we have, very high up, the yellow capella in order to get the charioteer. Use the belt stars pointing upwards, and you'll come first to Aldebaran, the red eye of the bull, and extending from that, the little V-shaped cluster of the Hyades, and further away, the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters. But I want you to direct your attention, please, to a much fainter star, the third magnitude Zeta Tauri, which does have a proper name, Al Hecker, which is hardly ever used. Now, Zeta Tauri is a perfectly ordinary white star, about a thousand sun power, but it's the guide to one of the most interesting objects in the sky, the gas patch we call the Crab Nebula. And you can just see it with good binoculars if you're lucky. And here's a sketch I made of it some time ago with a pair of 20 by 70 binoculars. There is Zeta Tauri, bottom of the field, and there the tiny glow of the Crab Nebula. 
and we know what it is. It's the remnant of a supernova, a colossal stellar explosion involving the virtual death of a star. And this was seen way back in the year 1054 by Chinese and Korean astronomers. It wasn't well documented in Europe. I think very likely that the American Indians saw it, and they may have recorded it on some of their old cave paintings, but we haven't got any detailed record of it. But we do know it became bright enough to be seen with the naked eye in broad daylight, and it lasted for months before fading away. Then, of course, it was lost. But in 1731, an astronomer named John Beavis recovered it as the gas patch we know as the crab, and that is the remnant of the supernova. The name, by the way, was given to it by the third Earl of Ross. And there he is. He was the man who built that superb 72-inch telescope in the middle of Ireland in 1845 and used it to discover the spiral galaxies. And there's an old painting of Lord Ross going up to observe. And it was he who drew the crab. This, in fact, is his drawing of it. It's not really very accurate, quite frankly, but you can understand why he called it the Crab Nebula. We also know it is 6,000 light years away, so when the old astronomers saw it, they were witnessing an explosion that happened 6,000 years ago. But the crab is really important. For one thing, it radiates almost the whole way over the electromagnetic spectrum. And secondly, right in it is the crab's powerhouse, the remnant of the old star, now a neutron star, which we call a pulsar, and that is sending out radio waves. And at this stage, I'm delighted to welcome back the 13th Astronomer Royal, Professor Sir Francis Graham Smith. Welcome back, Graham. First of all, what about supernovae in general? Well, let's uh, start off by saying what you actually see when uh, you're lucky enough to observe a supernova in the sky. Uh, there was one in 1987 in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is down in the south. And if you look at a picture of what the uh, star cloud, a very rich field, was like before the supernova, then you can see there are lots of stars there, and you can't guess which one was going to become the supernova. Now you see what happens when the supernova came. Suddenly there was a single bright star in the field, so much brighter than anything else, despite the fact that the, that nebula is so far away from us. So now uh, you've got a star which is producing an enormous flash of light. How does it do it? Well, a star in its normal existence, like the sun, is getting its energy from hydrogen. It's getting energy from hydrogen fusing into helium. It's a fusion power reactor. And the light comes out from the surface just because the star's kept hot. When the hydrogen is burnt up, which takes a little while, you know, some hundreds of thousands of millions of years, yes, then uh, uh, there is nothing now to keep the star shining. And furthermore, there's nothing to prevent it collapsing because there's gravity trying to pull it together and light trying to push it out. So it collapses and it does it very suddenly within a matter of seconds. So uh, the first thing that happens is that the whole star mass collapses into the center and releases a tremendous amount of gravitational energy. Two things are left. There is a condensed star left at the center, but that's not what you see. What you see is a cloud which is blowing outwards. Now there's uh, what happens. A single object blows out into a, a great big hot cloud. Now the exciting thing is that we know in great detail what's happening inside that cloud. It's very hot, there are very energetic particles in it, and you can get some nuclear processes in which don't occur before a star goes into this supernova explosion. You can get nuclear fusion. And you can get nuclear fusion, not just hydrogen to helium, but into much heavier elements. You can make, well, the uranium that we use in power uh, plants here, nuclear power plants, comes from the supernova explosion. All the heavy elements that, that are inside you and me, they come from supernova explosions. We can tell that this is happening because we, we know that in that cloud we can actually identify a process which shows us that cobalt and nickel are turning into iron because the cobalt and nickel are a radioactive form and if we look at the light curve of that explosion, the way in which the light changes with the time. There it goes, big explosion. But look, that long straight portion for some hundreds of days, that fits exactly what you expect from that straight line there, from the decay of nickel and cobalt with a 76-day time constant into iron. So we're actually seeing nuclear physics going on in that expanding cloud. Has it all gone now? 
Well, there is still the object at the center. In fact, we're still observing the cloud. It's got very faint and it's almost uh, dissipated. But at the center, we've got the very condensed object, which we call a neutron star. It's, it's matter, which is you know, a thousand million million times the density of ordinary matter. It's absolutely fantastic. But it is the basic building blocks of massive materials, neutrons, are actually tightly packed one against another. And it's an object which is about um, 10, 20 miles across only. Now, you wouldn't expect to be able to see that. And in fact, the idea of a neutron star has been around for a long time before it was ever observed. The, the reason that you can observe it is that it's spinning rapidly. And that's natural when a thing collapses. But um, I mean, like this little model, which I can spin with my finger, it's, um, you can detect it because it's spinning and it has a beam of radiation coming out from it like a lighthouse so that you can get this beam of radiation light or radio or gamma sweeping past you making a series of very regular pulses well uh, those pulses are so regular that we can monitor them and we can find a lot of very interesting physics about the neutron star. You'll see I'll be emphasizing the physics that goes on in these interesting <laughs> objects because basically I, I come from physics. Well, this um, rotating model here is uh, what we think of when we think of the pulsar at the center of the Crab Nebula. We've been watching it now for 23 years. At Jodrell Bank? Well, Jodrell Bank for the last 12 years, uh, but other places have provided their data. Over this 23 years, it's slowed down, but it's still going just under 30 times a second. Here's the graph of how it goes. It started at 30 and a quarter revolutions per second, and it's now going at just under 30 revolutions per second. So it's slowed down nice and regularly, so it seems. By about a tenth of a second? Well, that's, it's, um, it's to be expected that it would slow down by that amount, because if you keep on slowing down for a thousand years from a very rapid rotation, that's about where you expect to get. Now that smooth slowdown actually conceals a much more interesting behavior. There's another pulsar in the southern hemisphere which actually is rotating about 10 times a second. So the period between its pulses is about a tenth of a second. And that is getting slower. And you would expect to see a straight line again over the years that this has been observed. But look at that so-called straight mm. line. Uh, over the eight years this graph covers, there are three kinks in it. And these are what we call the glitches, when something funny happens to the rotation. Now, this is very exciting. The, the reason it's exciting and interesting to us is that the neutron star is not a solid. It's a shell with a liquid inside, like, uh, like an uncooked egg. And like an uncooked egg, the insides can move independently of the outsides. But these are very independently because it's a superfluid. It's a, a superfluid has no friction so that it can rotate inside faster than the outside. And what you're seeing at these glitches is just instance when the, uh, the inside happens to uh, clutch hold of the outside and give it a little jerk and make it move faster. So each time that happens, there's something happening just a little faster and it's an interaction between the superfluid and the solid outside of the pulsar. But the rotation of superfluid is very odd, isn't it, anyway? Well, it is very odd. Um, and uh, the, uh, the people in the laboratory will tell you exactly how that goes. We are interested in watching it because of this curious behavior. So that we have decided that we're going to watch the Crab Nebula practically every day. And at Jodrell Bank, in fact, we are looking at every day. You'll see here a picture of the famous Lovell telescope. We don't need to use that. We can use the smaller one in the foreground. It's a 42-foot telescope. And there it is again. Every day, that spends, oh, 20 minutes or so looking at the crab pulsar and working out whether it's going at the right speed and looking for one of these jerks, the, the glitches. Um, it's, uh, it's exciting when it does happen, but I'm, I have to tell you, we have to wait about four years <laughs> between glitches. When it does happen, it's very easy to see, even though the pulsar is behaving very regularly. It's, it's like a really excellent clock in the sky, which occasionally goes a bit wrong, as though a bit of grit has fallen into your wristwatch.
And in the same way as your watch, you can say whether it's fast or slow, you can draw a graph of what's happening on the crab pulsar, and you can say, well, it's right, it's right, it's right, and then suddenly it goes wrong. And you can see there, it goes wrong, and you've got a plot there of what happens for the 40 days after it goes wrong. That's 100 milliseconds. A tenth of a second error is the only... Uh, error that, that we see, but that is very significant, tells us what's happening inside. Something very interesting about the rotation of a superfluid, I wonder if you could say a bit more about it. Well, uh, the rotation is just like the rotation which you can see in the laboratory if you've got a low temperature laboratory and you can work on liquid helium. If you get a pot of liquid helium and try and turn it, it doesn't turn as a whole, it breaks up into little vortices, and the faster you go, the more vortices there are. I mean, it's an extraordinary circumstance, but that's because it's acting as a quantum fluid. Now, if you actually look at those vortices and you could somehow see them individually, as you slow, there they go, as you slow down, uh, then you're going to see the density of vortices decrease. They're going to move outwards. And what's actually happening in this rotation and, and the glitch is that the vortices actually catch on to the crust of the... Uh, rotating neutron star and speed it up. So we're seeing something which can be seen in liquid helium, can be seen in a star, and well, the exciting thing is to link the two, which seem to be so far apart. I gather you're now going to use the Hubble telescope. What are you going to do there? Oh, the Hubble telescope, well, that can work in the ultraviolet, of course, and this, this pulsar produces light, it produces ultraviolet, it produces gamma rays as well. If we work in the ultraviolet, we'll be looking at the way in which this beam, the lighthouse beam, forms. And that's a very interesting piece of physics. It's formed in a very strong magnetic field, very high energy particles. So we're going to look at the ultraviolet, look at the intensity of the, of the light and its polarization. And you'll be doing that in the near future? Well, uh, any minute now, we hope. <laughs> And, you know, the Crab Nebula is of exceptional importance, isn't it? Only 6,000 light years away. There are plenty of other pulsars, but this is the most special one. Well, there are 550 catalogued or so now, but there aren't any others which are only 1,000 years old, which we know so much about. I mean, the, the Crab Nebula and its pulsar are a wonderful laboratory. And this is really where physics and astronomy come together. Oh, they do. I mean, if, if you gave us only one object in the sky, it would have to be the Crab Nebula and the Pulsar. I sometimes think we could do without the rest because there's so much to do on the Crab. <laughs> well, certainly the Crab Nebula has told us a great deal. And it's a pity the supernova itself wasn't well documented. When we're going to have another supernova, I don't know. Only two on our galaxy since then, 1572, 1604. I'm sure you'll be very glad of a new galactic supernova. Well, it would be very exciting, but it better not be too close because they're fairly energetic objects. It could be quite uncomfortable. Meanwhile, we do have the crab. Graham, thank you very much. And remember, the crab is now on view in the evenings, and if you do have a telescope, you'll be able to find it. You won't be able to see the structure, of course, but you'll be able to locate it. So let's have one more look back at our star map. There's Orion, there's Aldebaran, there is Zeta Tauri, and near there you will see this tiny gas patch known as the crab. The universe can be a very violent place. When we come back next month, we're going to have a look around the sky, and I'm going to say rather more about the red planet Mars, which will then be at opposition. And meanwhile, if you want the latest information, then dial our Sky at Night line, 0898-666-000, or of course, dial up CFAX, page 625. And uh, since our next Sky at Night program won't be until 1993, I think it's probably not too early to wish you all a very happy Christmas and New Year. Good night.